what would happen to this guy. He ain't fighting in the UFC. And there it is, Fight Fans. We are live on MMA Weekly, and you were live on Saturday night in Jacksonville and all across the world. UFC 261, a huge success on every level. Man, what a night. Just listen to that. Let's, let's hear that again. Just listen to that, guys. You ready? Oh, yeah. Yes. Oh, I wanted to be there so bad, but we were there. MMA Weekly was there, so we were all there together. I'm Jim Greasehopper. Call me Grease. My man, Jeff Kane. The Kaniacs in full effect today. The chat room is going full speed ahead, guys. You know, we had the preview up on YouTube. Love it when you guys are waiting for us when we get here. Really appreciate the support. Big numbers again for the show on Saturday night. So here's what we need you guys to do, okay? Our YouTube is really close to 600K. We're going to be at a million by the end of the year. Okay, you heard it. We're going to be at a million by the end of the year. We're going to get that gold, whatever they send you, for the MMA Weekly Ownership Group when you hit a million because that's where we're going. And, guys, we're so close to 600K. So if you're not subscribed right now, please hit that button, hit that bell, comment in the chat, have some fun with us. We're here three times a week, Jeff and I, and we're really excited to have you with us for UFC Fallout 261, powered by CBD Emporium, featuring Level Select CBD. I made a mistake with it this morning, and I'll tell you guys in a minute. But right now, I'm going to tell you how it changes my life every single day. I'm putting on the creams, the roll-ons, dropping the tincture under my tongue. Why? Because I don't need aspirin. I don't need ibuprofen. I don't need acetaminophen. I'm not rotting out the inside of my body with opiates or painkillers or anything else. And I'm doing it safely and very, very healthy stuff. We're talking organic. We're talking the purest of the pure from CBD Emporium and Level Select CBD. And right now, you can take advantage of our special right here, MMA 50. Because you're UFC fans, because you're MMA fans, because you subscribe to MMA Weekly. And if you haven't, go do it, please. Because you're subscribed to MMA Weekly, guys, you're going to get 50% off. Go to stayinthefightmma.com and put in the code MMA50. Stay in the fight, MMA, MMA 50, Level Select CBD. Stay in the fight. All right, Jeff, here we go. We opened up with the fans, man, and that's the biggest story of the night. No matter who fought on the card, no matter what happened on the card, no matter how magnificent the three headliners were, Valentina Shevchenko, Rose Namajunas, and Kamaru Usman, no matter how sad we all are and how crappy it is for Chris Weidman with his broken leg, and you know, no matter how many times this asshole Jake Paul shows up, you know, the number one story is still the fans are back. Yeah, the fans are back. They'll be back. Uh, we got the next two events at the Apex, and then we got fans back again in Texas and then and in Las Vegas. It's opening back up. Uh, but Jacksonville, like last year, was the first. <laughs> you know, was the first to bring the fans back, and there they are in the building, screaming and I yelling, used to call it chanting Florida. USA. <laughs> USA. I kind of forgot about to... how. I... Go ahead. Go ahead, Jeff. I'm sorry, you cut out. I didn't mean to interrupt you. What were you saying? No, I was saying I kind of forgot. I, kind of, I, I missed the fans, but I didn't miss like the USA chants and and stuff like that. But without the fans, we wouldn't have got that beautiful "fuck Jake Paul" chant either. 
Oh, that was awesome. But you know, I, I do want to say we, we are going to talk about Jake Paul, but we promised the update on Chris Weidman. And we're going to start with that. We started with the fans because obviously that's the biggest story. And we got a lot to talk about in a relatively short show today, Jeff. We got John Jones and his management team splitting up in the wake of the disastrous PR stunt or whatever you want to call that with the negotiations with Dana White. Um, we've got fight news with Marvin Vittori and Israel Adesanya. We've got, man, all kinds of stuff. Conor McGregor buys the pub where he slapped the old man and then immediately bans him for life and then donates 500000 to, to to the Boys and Girls Clubs of Louisiana, but not through Poirier's charity. So there's a big slap in the face of, like, we're giving the money that we said we were going to give, and we're giving it to the people who you, you are going to give it to anyway, but we're not doing it through you, Dustin. So all that going on, Jeff, but... Man, Chris Weidman is the story, and there's my guy. I, I say my guy. I mean, the All-American, you don't get a nickname like that unless people love you. And, you know, I, I will say this about Chris. I've known him for a long time. First time I met Chris was 2011, maybe? Maybe at Power MMA and Fitness because he was represented by the same guy as um, Ryan Bader and Aaron Simpson and C.B. Dalloway. And, you know, Robbie Lawler was training there at the time. And, you know, he would come out whenever he was in Arizona, which wasn't very often, and he would train there. Or when we were all in Vegas – whatever. And, you know, he'd always meet up with Bader and Aaron and all of us. So got to know him a little bit over the years and years ago. So as he was in that, that meteoric rise, when he was smashing guys like Munoz, and then he gets the title shot against Anderson Silva, Jeff, to see that compound fracture, which actually, as far as injuries go, it's better for him to have had that than some of the things that could have happened in his leg. Like for example, what Alex Smith did, you know, to his knee and just obliterating ligaments and tendons everywhere, the clean break, the, the technology and the medicine is so good now. But the one thing that I couldn't help but think, and everybody said the same thing, is the irony. You know, Weidman Silva, too. I was right there, man. I was 10 feet away. I'm sure you were also. I was right there cage side, you know, covering the event. And, I mean, you just saw that right away, and you could hear a pin drop. And, and that's something that, Jeff, you can never unsee. That is very vivid. The sound that he made, the 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 the, the visual the literally the crowd's reaction and the pin drop. I still feel every one of those things like it happened five minutes ago when I was there for Silva's. So it's, it's just terrible for everyone who has to see it and be involved. And obviously for Chris Weidman, a guy who's been struggling, hanging on in his career, a former champion and a great champion. Let's not forget how badly he dominated Lyoto Machida and that five round war over that summer in 2014 when he, you know, Vitor, but then the Rockhold fight happened. And ever since then it was big time downhill for Chris, but Talk about a guy who's had bad luck, Jeff. Can you believe this guy's luck in his career? The injuries, the things that have happened to him since he won that belt and lost it. I mean, the Musasi fight, you know, Romero, he just goes in for a shot and, and catches the knee. It just it just seems like this guy has been snake bit since he lost that title. Like he can't catch a break. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> no, no pun intended. And, I, and ironically, no yeah, intended. stupid Jim. Yeah, that wasn't on purpose. <laughs> no, it, most it's of my fine. best material uh, is by accident, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, look, uh, you, you know, he's he has he is on the decline of his career. He's he's up in age, um, and he was trying to get back to to that status, back to relevancy in the middleweight division again, and um, you know, snapped his leg on the first exchange. Look, everybody who saw that. Had to. I mean, the first thing I thought of was Anderson Silva. The and, and look, and and I think Chris Weidman wouldn't be truthful if he didn't say that he that that went through his head when that happened, or shortly thereafter, anyway. Because the, yeah, the irony. Look, that's happened three times in UFC history. Chris Weidman was in the octagon twice, <laughs> you, you know. Um, and then wow. the late Corey Hill did the same thing way back in like 2008 or whatever. Um, but yeah, gruesome injury. No, you can't see it. And Tyrone Spong, I was right. Uh, about the kickboxer, I, I was a he was a devastating kickboxer. Same thing, leg kick, boom, snap, same spot. It, it's uh, it, but like you said, it, the injury is better than than it could have been if it were different things. The compound fracture does raise the uh, possibility of of infection, and that's but that's all Chris has to worry about right right now is infection. Yeah, you, you know the, the mm -hmm. he's had the surgery. Uh, they've got the rod in his leg. They've got the screws there. Now it's just healing and being on the mend and staying off of it. What sucks for Chris, and I know because I have two fake hips and I've gone through multiple surgeries, is it's his right leg that he can't drive a car now. <laughs> you know, he, he's got the whole cast on. So getting around yeah. for the next six to eight weeks is going to be a friggin' nightmare. Taking a shower. And he's a it's dad. The little thing. Yep. Yeah, it's the little things yep. that's going to affect Young him right kids. now. Yeah. And so inconvenience is what he's going to have to deal with right now. And a hell of a lot of pain. A hell of a lot of pain. Um, 
but that'll all go away. He can come back, uh, you know, but we're going to need more updates a- as we go along. Is he going to have to have that rod removed before he competes again? I think Anderson still has a rod in his leg, uh, but it depends on the doctors and, and what they recommend. Some don't want you to have that rod in there and they'll, get, they'll take it out. Uh, and then others are like, yeah, that rod's fine. Oh, um, just look at that. Look at that, Jeff. So we'll see as it progresses. Yeah, oh. man, that was a cra- – I mean, it was such a – what's so amazing about that about that break was that Weidman didn't even know. Because, I mean, anybody that's thrown leg kicks, look, it, it hurts like hell when you get your leg – when you get a, a mm-hmm. leg kick check, right? But you're fighters, right? You just oh. got poker face. You don't show that, right? You got to get big golf ball knot on your shin, but you're acting like nothing happened. Well, So when Chris landed that, it probably hurt like hell, but that's normal. And, and his face is just like, I'm in a fight, no big deal. And then he steps back on it, and that's when reality set in. Uh, and, you, and you see it. You see it on his face. You see the That was the worst part for me. When he stepped back yeah. on it, and he didn't, he hadn't, it was already shattered in half, but he hadn't realized it yet. And then when yeah. he stepped on it to see the look on his face when he went down, oh, my God. that That's just, man, that's the part yeah. that I'm talking about. I, I can't get that out of my head, and it's, it sucks. And, and, and Uriah Hall was extremely classy extremely classy uh you know there was no celebration and i don't and you know i don't know why he would celebrate in that anyway but but look it's a victory you know and so i, I and, and you did put in a training camp but but that's also for 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 hall sort of a victim in that as well you know he put in a training camp he doesn't even get to throw a punch you know he set a record for for being a ufc winner without ever throwing a strike in a fight you know he holds that record now and you really, know, and Dana tweeted that or put that right out on social media, and it almost seemed kind of callous, like no regard for Weidman, no, hey, get well soon, champ, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Just, yeah I mean, I, I just was surprised that you didn't see that from the boss. But, you know, Weidman, dude, I, I know for a fact that he turned down a big money deal at one point from a huge promotion. Um, and, and I know that he's still fighting it out with the UFC. And, you know, he I give him credit, man. The people who he's lost to, are not, I mean, he lost to killers. I mean, you talk about Rockhold, Romero, Musasi, Jacare, Dominic Reyes, and now Uriah Hall because of the injury. But the guys who beat him, those five guys are among the top guys in the sport or were at the time. And so when I think about that, you know, I mean, it sucks for guys who reach the top on that level. Like you get all the way to the top and then you just can't beat the best guys anymore. You know, it used to happen with Ryan Bader. He beat everybody but Machida. And, and, you know, some of those guys as he's as a, in Rumble, he'd get right there and then he'd always lose to that guy. But Weidman losing to all these fighters, kind of like Woodley, they're losing to the best in the world. And Woodley, by the way, his contract is up and he's not in the rankings at all. He dropped completely out. So I was going to ask you if he was even on the ballot this time because his contract's up and how that all works. Uh, but I know that's just real quick off the topic, he, but I, I wondered mean, that. Well, he was in my ranking, so I don't, I don't know. I mean, honestly, whenever you say that, I, I, it's because I didn't pull him from the rankings completely off of my list, um, and so I think he was on the list to be ranked. I, th- I think that he was, um, but I'm not. I, I don't quote me on that. Don't quote me on that. There's Man, no way that there's kind of 15 crazy. fighters. There, there were are... several people. Yeah, there were several people in the rankings that were not a- able to be ranked this week. There were blank spots, uh, and I guess that's because they've been cut by the UFC. I don't know. <laughs> investigative journalist out there you can go look at that and figure out maybe yeah. he was cut i don't have the i don't have the time for that nor nor do i care uh, much um you know if the 12th well, well no cut, if it's woodley you'd care we'd care but I, what i was going to say is and his contract's up but what i was going to say about weidman you know he's in that category now jeff where he's losing to the top guys but if weidman mm-hmm. wants to continue to have a career and just fight guys and, and make money fights and do things like that he's not a huge draw but he can bank he can make some money I know Chris wants to be the champion again. He literally is is a competitor to the bone, and uh, and I also didn't do that on purpose. Jeez, um, but Chris is literally. I mean, I know he wants to keep going, and I know he's always. I mean, and and Jeff, we talk all the time about inspiration, right? That's my purpose in life is to inspire as many people as possible. How can you not be inspired by a guy who is on top of the world and just keeps facing setback after setback after setback, and it's shitty, and so many people in life go I, oh well, look what happened to me I, I would have been this but this but that but that Chris Weidman is proof that what you have inside of you is what makes that determination throughout your life and that nothing can stop you but people were talking about possibly and I wondered you know on the show even Jeff was Chris going too long then he got the win against you know Akhmedov and you thought okay he got another win under his belt you know he can still beat those guys 
He's going to keep going. Maybe eventually we talked about him possibly getting another title shot. What would what would need to happen for that? But now he's six to 12 months away from even possibly being able to train again. Oh, yeah. He's going to be out for a long time. Um, I mean, he's got to, he's out six weeks for the for the bone to heal minimal. <laughs> you know, and that's what that's if everything yeah. goes absolutely perfect. And so at the end of the six weeks, he still has not put any weight on that leg. Uh, you, you know, and so then he's going to have to go through physical therapy, get, get the, you know, the ankle's going to get all tight. The knee's going to be tight. The leg's going to be really, really weak. And so he's going to have months of re rehabilitation in order to do that. And, and during this time frame, you know, Wyvern's going to have to decide, is this worth it? <laughs> you know, I mean, cause he's not a young guy. Do you want to put in the time and the energy? Yes. He's going to put in the time and energy to come back to normal, to, to have a, a normal life. But is he going to put in the time and effort that it takes to become to come back and fight? Because that's a different deal altogether. To to train yeah. and get back in the gym and to throw leg kicks with that damn leg again and to do all that. And so, and at his age, I'm kind of on the fence on, on whether we'll see Chris Wyman in the octagon again. I hope we do. I think it'll be a, a really you know uh, heroic moment, you know, a comeback story. But at the same time, uh, Chris is going to have to you know have a come to Jesus moment here in the next year and figure out if it is worth it to him and his family, what he's looking for in the future to even, to even come back, you, you know, maybe, maybe his uh, place in the fight game's not in the octagon anymore. Maybe it's as a coach, maybe it's as a commentator, maybe it's something else. We know Chris Wyman. Chris Wyman's going to try to fight again. Uh, that yeah. I know for sure. But then I, we also know that he is a father and he's a family man and, and they have a, a large input in, 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 in where Chris goes moving forward. I, I, absolutely. You know, and it's hard to put your family through that. Uh, being a and he's I've made been money. Racing. Yeah, I, he's I've been made money, and, and he owns a gym too. Yeah, no, I it. mean, I'm not saying that the he's Mongo. broke, but he's you know or anything like that. But he does have this influx of money when he fights. You know, and, and you get to rely on it. Uh, and, and it's hard for families of fighters. You, you know, like I said, I've been around racing my whole life and had and, and know some people who've been you know critically injured in crashes and the family to, to watch their loved one go out there and compete when so much is on the line it's nerve-wracking as hell and then for them to see him snap his leg like this i i, I just don't know that we're going to see chris back not because of chris weidman but because of those around him are just like you know chris is this worth it you know is this worth doing uh i think we'll see him again though because chris weidman's a tough a tough guy man and he's not going to let this keep him you know he, he's he's not going to let this end his career uh, so I think we'll see him again, but man, he's got a long road, Jim. He's got a long road ahead of him. What's Chris Weidman's legacy, guys? If he never fights again, let's let's see it in the chat, and then we're gonna move on, and we'll talk about the the fallout. So, oh, here's Dana White on Chris Weidman. Very young guy. We saw the challenges Anderson Silva had with the same injury. I think I th to yeah. Let's not. I don't even want to talk about it tonight. I don't want to say anything. Fucking, you know, yeah. guys laying in the hospital right now. So. Well, let's let's see how he gets through this injury, and we'll go from there. We'll send him our best. Thanks. All right, there you go. What do you take from that? Dana didn't I, want I to say anything Dana, bad about him. Like, do you think Dan might have said, "Hey, he's done. It's time for him to hang it." You think he he meant like he didn't want to say something like that? Well, I think that what yeah, I think that Dana was asked a question, and Dana didn't want to say, I, "I'd like to see Chris Weidman retire," while Chris Weidman is laying in the hospital getting prepped yeah. for surgery. I, I think that that's what it was. Uh, I think that Dana is, is one of those people, you know, who, who are around Chris Weidman that's, that's going to have some input on, on whether he comes back. Um, you know, yeah, I just think that was Dana not wanting to be an asshole, you know, uh, which is weird because that's not something he usually shies away from. But in this case, he absolutely <laughs> did. You know, I mean, I'm not he embraces touching that. It. <laughs> yeah, he totally embraces it. Uh, yeah. But, but yeah, you I saw him on like Hannity, you know what I'm classy. talking about. Did you see Dana on yeah. Hannity by any chance, anyone? No. I didn't see no. it. But he was yeah. on Hannity talking about Florida and coming back and the fans and all that. No, I didn't I didn't I didn't see that. I probably won't see that, but No, me neither. Yeah, but he's, yeah, he's, I just think he's that proud. Dana was being classy. Yeah, I think that Dana was being classy right there. I just didn't want to throw, you know, dirt on a guy who's who's got one foot in the grave already, you know, in his in his career and, and he's laid in the hospital bed. He didn't want to he just didn't want to do that to him. Uh, I think if you ask Dana here at the next event, what do you think about Chris Weidman? He'll he'll be honest with you and tell you exactly what you know what he feels about it. But in that what moment, there wasn't it, yeah. you know there's a time, there's a time and place for everything, and that wasn't the time. No, and Chris Weidman's legacy to me is a um, 
is a middle, a great middleweight champion who defended the belt three times. I mean, that's the way I look at Chris. I mean, what a great story. The first win over Anderson Silva, unbelievable. Well, Chris One of the biggest legacy. stories in my career in NBA when he beat Silva. In NBA, in MMA, when he beat Silva. Yeah. And to me, that was one of the biggest moments, right, in the history of the sport. That was one of those moments that you look at, especially in the 2010s. You know, that's one of the top five stories of the 2010s, really. Well, Weidman beating that's Silva. That's his legacy. I mean, that, yeah, that's, that is that's his Weidman's legacy. legacy is he ended Anderson Silva's reign, uh, which is kind of crazy. That, that Yeah, you know, Advocate um, for Peace said it in the chat. Good job. He'll always remember Weidman for K KOing the greatest 185 or two have ever fought. At the time, and ended that reign. I mean, Anderson Anderson mm -hmm. dominated for so many years. I mean, he was it was just Anderson Silva, uh, and that was such a weird fight week too. You know, Anderson was acting strange, and then and then, you know he got clipped, uh, and then in the rematch, you know, I think that that you that he's kind of known for that too. He's like he's not only the guy that beat Anderson Silva, he's the guy that snapped Anderson Silva's leg. You know, um, and so I think that that's his legacy when you come down to it, and that is his legacy. You know, I mean that that that's that the is. crowning moment in his career. That that's his biggest achievement is he dethroned Anderson Silva, uh, and so that's what Weidman's always going to be known for. Yep, and and the leg injuries because the Silva and his. So you're gonna probably maybe even the leg injuries on top of that is what people are going to think of first. But right there with beating Silva, so the two you mentioned it only happened three times, and he was involved in both fights. But when when you think about the magnitude of that win over Anderson Silva. Anderson Silva was never the same, obviously, after the broken leg either. But that was the first of seven losses in nine fights for Silva. And one was a no contest that was overturned. You know what I'm saying? So, But it was a win that got overturned. So he didn't get the win. But, man, seven losses in eight official decisions minus the no contest. That's crazy. He never was the same. You could say that it was Weidman beating him. You could say it was the injury. You could say with the first Chael fight that he was kind of slipping a little bit then. But he, you're right, man, to end that streak and to end Silva's reign atop that division, I mean, it just unbelievable, man. It really was just one of those things that, you know, you'll never forget where you were. I'll never forget the press room after when Weidman came in for the press conference at the old MGM Grand Garden Arena. Was it room A or room B? Whatever room they had us in, you'd be walking in from the casino and it was on the left there. And I remember him and his dad and everybody so happy and proud. And, you know, we knew we were witnessing history. And that seems like yesterday, man. And it was International Fight Week, 4th of July week on um, UFC 162, I want to say, in Vegas. There you go. So that's a long time ago, man. But yeah, I, I mean, just the legacy of a champion for Chris Weidman. Let's keep it on Dana for a minute, um, Jeff, and then we'll segue to Jake Paul and hit the rest of this card. But what a busy, what a crazy week for Dana White, right? The fans come back. They're in Florida. Everyone's hailing him as a hero. He's got the governor with him. He's got the mayor with him. He's on Hannity. He he literally is just basking in the glow of being the first sport back last year and this year. And, you know, I mean, he's earned it. He's earned it. He's earned every bit of the praise he's getting right now and every bit of that limelight for the UFC, which has set the, the tone and the standard for the entire sports world. And arguably, you know, for our fans say, hey, you know, you guys can get through this. Just keep moving. Keep going. Keep fighting. And that's how Dana White is, and that's what he did. I interviewed him in August, and he said, man, he goes, we had to build a freaking hotel and a hospital here, you know? And uh, just whatever he had to do to get it done. So he he's earned that. So he's got that part of it, Jeff. And, uh, you know, Dana White, I don't know if we have a clip right here of him talking about the fans coming back. We've had a lot of milestones and, you know, things like that. I think just the whole getting through COVID, doing it safely, uh, being the first one to come back and then, you know, doing this tonight with a full indoor crowd. Um, we, we COVID tested this whole week with the athletes and us. I COVID tested all week and, and uh, everybody was good and we did it again, you know. It's time, to, it's time to get back to normal, you know. And I know a lot of you guys in the media don't feel exactly the way I do about a lot of things, uh, but you, you can't deny it felt pretty fucking good to be in Florida this week and, and be normal. If you want to wear a mask, wear a mask. If you don't want to wear a mask, don't wear a mask. And when I saw people wear a mask, I didn't say anything to people wear a mask. When people saw people that weren't wearing masks, nobody said anything to people that weren't wearing masks. Everybody's just doing their things. You know what? People seem like they're a lot happier down here in Florida than they are in some of these other fucking states. You know what I mean? 
everybody's doing their thing down here and, and, and living their life, and that's the way it's supposed to be. So it felt good to be here. It felt good to have, um, uh, you know, the mayor, the governor, and all these people working with us to put on a safe event and uh, for people to come out and have fun. It was, it was awesome. It literally couldn't have been better. We couldn't uh, uh, have planned this any better or done it any better than we did with us and, and, and try to make this thing safe and, and, and instead of just hiding and saying nothing can be done and, and just shutting down and laying people off and, and uh, you know, th that's never an answer. So, so to be able to have like-minded people that were willing to, to, to try to pull this thing off safely. And these guys were so good to us coming in. I said, listen, when this thing opens back up, I will reciprocate and I will come back and, and I'll put on a fight that, that means something to this city. And you couldn't get a hotel room th this weekend in Jacksonville. Um, we, we tried to get more hotel rooms for people that were coming in. We couldn't. I don't know what your, you know, your, your, your experiences were with restaurants, but restaurants were hard to get into. Bars were packed. I mean, this, this town was booming this weekend, and that was how I wanted to pay Jacksonville back for what they did for me uh, a year ago to, to help me run my business. Will you be back again, Jacksonville? Are you playing in the yeah, future? Absolutely. I mean, now, you know, what, what we want to do is we'll move all over Florida and, you know, do a lot of different cities in Florida um, to repay uh, the governor of this state for, for, for uh, everything he's done for us. All right, there's Dana White. The boss man, Jeff, there are, we could do 10 shows just based on that clip. A great clip. Exactly, you know, you're always going to get you know, how Dana feels and, you know, raw and real. And that's how exactly how he feels. He, he feels accomplished. I, I'm sure there was a little sigh of relief. And I, I don't know, Florida probably wouldn't release the numbers anyway, but I don't know. And I think it's too soon to tell. It's going to be a couple weeks, see if there's any spikes or anything. But the UFC's back. They did it first. They did it again. And Dana White continues to lead the way and prove why he's the best executive in sports. No one touches him. No one. Silver, I think, is second. And he's nowhere near. I, I mean, I don't, I don't know enough of the other sports to to even compare Dana to him. I mean, look, we're, we were opening back up, you know, the, the, there are places that are opening back up. Con I mean, I just bought concert tickets for for concerts. They're going to, you know, have ten, twenty thousand people there. Yeah. Uh, so things are Who'd opening up. But Dana for? got in first. I'm sorry, I, I'm going to see you? Billy Strings in uh, Manchester, Tennessee, and then uh, Widespread Panic on New Year's Eve in Atlanta. Oh. Widespread panic in Atlanta on New Year's Eve. Not bad. That's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, so Dana, I mean, of course, he's feeling great right now. The, the toast of the sports world, everybody's raving about Dana White in the UFC. The money that they've made, they're going public again. They're going to try to take it public again with Endeavor. And that's something that, you know, the UFC is a huge driving force because while everyone else was losing and shutting down and hemorrhaging money, and while everyone else was trying to figure out what to do, Dana led the way. And then top rank boxing got smart and did exactly what he did pretty much, except they made the bubble at the MGM Grand for boxing. And then Bellator did it at the Mohegan Sun Casino in Connecticut. And it, it all started with Dana White. The NBA bubble was after the UFC apex and all that came. And, and so many of, of those things came as a result of the work and the effort that Dana White and his team put in. He's always giving credit to his team. You know, people always say, Hey, get on your knees some more for Dana. Everyone should appreciate what Dana White has done for all of us. Joe Rogan says it every way in. Dana White, without him, none of this would be possible. Simple. Without him. Imagine any Dem running against DFW for pres. Oh, good Lord. The, the debates would be called a massacre or a war crime. I can't even imagine. If, if people hated Trump, oh my him. God. <laughs> Can you imagine how much they'd hate Dana White? But I mean, I swear he might be that guy that could bring everybody together. But I just, I, the one question in The Rock's even talking about, like, who the hell would want to be president? I mean, really. Be careful. You be careful. Obama, like, what, yeah, you got to be careful. Obama's hair was white in two years. That in two years, his hair was white, Obama. Two years. That's it. Oh, well, it's a stressful It's a stressful job. I mean, being the leader of the free world for people that take it seriously. Um, Dana probably could run for politics. But then again, I don't know. I don't know how many skeletons are in his closet, you know, because the and you don't know until somebody goes into politics. And then oh, we all find out. Oh, yeah. Uh, and so I don't know. Plus, I don't think Dana wants to go into politics. But yes, uh, I don't know who said it. But uh, if you want to be the leader of the free world, then you're a narcissistic psychopath, period. <laughs> who, who the hell else runs for that job? You know, that, that, a narcissistic psychopath. 
There's the clip of the show right who, who there from Jeff else, Koenig. Who else strives to, to who else strives to take over the world? I mean, just think about it. Plankton, plankton on SpongeBob. You, you plankton. Know, there's a plankton <laughs> in Looney Tunes. You know, in the real world, if you want to, if you if you think you should be leading the free world, then your ass is a narcissistic sociopath, man. I mean, that's the end of it. That's plankton. Your, I don't care who you are. That's a plankton. Yeah, that's a damn Doctor plankton. Evil. One. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I shall rule that the goes, world. That goes political lines. That, that goes for both parties, or they're even a third party, man. You got to be crazy. Need the super the friends world. to stop them. Well, and and we know one thing. Look, Dana's not going to get Jake Paul's vote, but Jake Paul may be um, enough of a narcissistic psychopath to run for president one day. I mean, look, I'll give this kid credit on something, and and I I know Dana with the fans back and all the credit in the world to the boss man and all the big fights coming up, and you know the argument with John Jones about. Dana White's thoughts on the whole thing, and we're going to play it in a minute. Just, just I'm, I want to set this up um, perfectly. He's not a fan, obviously, of what Jake Paul pretty much, you know, kind of thinks Triller's a laughing stock. We're going to hear in a second from Dana White, but there is Jake Paul right there coming into the arena. But I will say this about this kid. He's in his 20s. He's got tons and millions of followers, dude. And he, every time he does anything, it's huge news. He was at the riots. And they weren't even riots. They were a bunch of white teenagers screaming Black Lives Matter, stealing iPads. Let's be real. In Scottsdale, Arizona. But Jake Paul was there and he had a, a bottle of stolen liquor in his hand because they had broke into P.F. Chang's and, and stole a bunch of liquor. And he had one of the bottles in his hand and he's facing charge that, charges for that here. But, you know, he's got women accusing him of things. But at the end of the day, man, this kid, this fucking kid is the story at the first fight back with fans. This guy walks into the arena. The whole place starts screaming, fuck Jake Paul. He gets Daniel Cormier, a legendary two-division champ who is a, a lock to be a UFC Hall of Famer, one of the greatest fighters, one of the most important people in the sport right now, Daniel Cormier. People have talked about him replacing Dana one day. That's how important DC is in our sport. What happens when Jake Paul gets there? He gets Daniel Cormier up out of his chair from the announce table. I've been a play-by-play -play guy for 25 years. I never leave the announce table for anything during a show. Jake Paul got DC up and out of his seat to go put his finger in his face. He got the whole arena screaming, fuck Jake Paul. And he's got the whole world up in arms. And the whole MMA world is buying it and biting into it and giving him exactly what he wants. Hook, we're, we're doing it right now. Hook, line, and sinker. Here we go. You got us, Jake. There you go, Ruddy. Right there. You got us. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, Jake Paul's Jake Paul. He is what he is, but he's not a fighter. Uh, he promotes himself, and it's a flash in the pan, right? You, you know, uh, his gimmick will be gone, uh, and not soon enough. Uh, who knows how long he'll stick around? You know, he does have a lot of followers, but there's a shit ton of influencers that have zero followers today that were, you know, world-renowned five years ago. Jake Paul will be that in five years. But in the meantime, he's going to try to make a crap ton of money, and he's going to insert himself all over the place. Cormier shouldn't have given him... Uh, the time of day. I mean, you know, that, that, that's how I feel about Jake Paul. And I don't Me care too. what anybody says, you, you know, I mean, don't, why give him the time of day? And then this is going to sound nuts, but if I had an opportunity to interview Jake Paul and Jake Paul's this big fucking celebrity guy, I'm not even interviewing. I don't, I'm not even giving him the time of day. He, he doesn't deserve the time of day. He's a, he's a damn internet celebrity who, who's conning America into thinking that he's a real fighter. And then Cormier's get, feeding it, fueling into that. And Dana's even fueling into that. And the media's fueling into it. But at the end of the day, Jake Paul couldn't beat, you know, <laughs> any real fighter, which is why he's not fighting real fighters, which is why he's calling out retired wrestlers rolling off their couch out of shape and yep. retired for NBA players and other YouTube stars. He is not calling out real fighters. And, and, um, and yeah, well, Ben I mean, look, Askins a real fighter, a real though. Fight. Not a real boxer. I mean, so let's not confuse the two. <laughs> you know, no. I, you can be a boxer and not be a fighter, in my opinion. But still, uh, still, to knock out Ben Askren, unless Ben Askren took a dive, and I, I know Ben, so I would never accuse him of that. He's a good dude. I actually know him pretty well. But I think that um, from when he was an assistant coach at Arizona State Wrestling, that's how I met him. And, um, you know, I mean, look, he's been a, a two-promotion champion. He was undefeated in Bellator and won, you know, came to the UFC and beat Robbie Lawler and withstood some big strikes from Robbie Lawler without those pillow gloves that boxers wear. So how does he survive those shots from Robbie Lawler? And he ends up literally, you know, getting stopped by one punch by Jake Paul. The ref stops the fight, 
I mean, I didn't think the fight should have been stopped, and I can't believe I'm even calling it a fight. But at the end of the day, man, this gave Jake Paul a lot of credibility because most idiots out there did, are just going to say he knocked out an his, MMA fighter. It, it gives it gives him credibility to people whose opinions don't matter. You know, all opinions aren't equal. And and if your opinion is that Jake Paul's a legitimate fighter, then your opinion is absolutely fucking useless to me. That guy's not. And and then at the end of the look, if Ben Askren went into boxing, like like if he left MMA and went into boxing, he gets knocked out by everybody. We all he'd know probably that. be winless. He, yeah, he'd be winless. It's knocked out by every single one. You, you know, Jake Paul's not calling out Robbie Lawler. He's not calling out fighters who have who have boxing backgrounds. He's not calling them out. He's calling out specific wrestlers who, who have spent their entire lives not knowing what a boxing glove was. He said he'll box and, DC. I mean, I think yeah. DC would kill him in a boxing match. It, he, DC might. He might not. It, it doesn't I matter because would, in a real too. fight. In a real fight, Jake Paul doesn't even – Jake Paul won't even enter a fight. I mean, that, I mean, that's the reality of it. Jake Paul can sit over there and say, I'll box this person, I'll box that person. Get in the damn cage then. So you if know? you're Dana White, if, 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 if you're Dana White, do you fighter, try to get him in there? Do you try to get him in there no, if you're Dana White? That's a legit no. question because he put CM Punk in there. I mean, why not? Yeah. In this world we live in, there's no difference because between Jake Paul and a WWE star, really. Well, I mean – they're actually athletes, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I don't even yeah, consider I mean, him an athlete. <laughs> you know? I give the kid credit, I mean, man. I give him credit because he's got balls of steel to get in there with Askren and to put this whole thing together and to make the money he's making and, and to put the business of Jake Paul out there the way he does is really admirable. He's great. He's great at but that. There's a lot of I'm things I won't do, right? And he like, actually can fight uh, a little bit, but he's not a fighter. I, I, I don't give him any credit because, like I said, there's a lot of shit I won't do. I won't ride a motorcycle without a helmet. I won't get on a roller coaster unless the seatbelt's tight. Boxing Ben Askren is not one of the things that are on the list of shit that I wouldn't do. Like, oh, my God, I'm going to do – I'm going to box Ben Askren. My life's in danger. I'm going to get CTE. None of that enters my mind. None of it. All right, well, let's – What, what enters my mind this... is when I hit him with a jab, is he going to take me down? That's the only thing that's I'm the, thinking about. That's the only thing you're thinking of. So let's let's put this – there was a great – something from the chat. Let's put that back up. Advocate for peace. LOL, Jeff gets so upset that I want to take the opposite opinion to set him off, but he's absolutely correct. Jake Paul is playing the sports media virtually perfectly. First of all, there is no sports media. That word doesn't exist anymore, uh, just well, like I journalism. I because the fact that. That, that that even even <laughs> people who covered it, people who I mean, to sit there cage side and get a live reaction from Logan Paul, just to me, I don't know. I I I, I say that very strongly, Jeff, and I know that there's still people out there, media and journals, but you just can't trust anything you read anymore. You can't even trust the Fox News, the MSNBCs. You, you can't trust <laughs> CNN. They're all so slanted toward whatever side they're for. Is my point. But the, media, but the problem is, is that people confuse people confuse TV personalities with journalists. Sean yeah. Hannity's not a fucking journalist. Tucker Carlson's not a journalist. Rachel Maddow's not a journalist. They're Stephen A. Smith's not a journalist. TV personalities. They're TV personalities. So what do they do? They quote real journalists in articles. They do. There's your journalist. They do. So if you want, if you want news, go to the source. If I want to hear what a politician says, I watch C-SPAN. I don't need it regurgitated to me by some talking head. I can read. I have eyes. I have ears. I don't need you to hold my hand through the current events of the world. And the problem is, is that it's a lot of people just will sit there and watch TV and think that they're getting the news when you are getting a paid for advertisement from a network to sell right, you fucking products. Right, and on social media. And on social media, exactly. So, But as it applies to the MMA media, so to speak, um, I just think the line gets blurred tremendously too. And and it's something that we live in a world where everything sells and everything has a dollar figure on it and you can sell anything to a big enough you know audience and platform that you've created on social media and everybody is buying into this whole thing. I, I went like this, but we're all guilty of it. I'm guilty of it. You know, I, the words leaving my mouth kind of sicken me. You know how you're about to puke and you get that sour taste? That's kind of how I feel saying his name in a serious context of an MMA show. I hate it. But, you know, he did He did walk into the first fight back with fans. He said he was a guest of the UFC, by the way, which you don't you don't believe a thing the kid says. But, I mean, look, to, to do and, – and, you know, we, we got to get that Dana clip up there because you know how Dana feels about it, and it's always entertaining. Here's Dana's thoughts on Triller and Jake Paul. And this kid's done a good job of putting himself in a place to make some money, man, you know? 
So good for him. Um, he's got you guys talking about him all the time and asking questions about him and got Daniel Cormier running after him. So he's doing something right. You know, he knocked out an NBA guy that was 40 years old and 30 pounds less than him. And, you know, uh, I don't even know what to think about the Askren thing, man. I, I, it's, uh, the whole thing is fucking mind-boggling to me. But, um, hey, good for him. Grab that money while you can, kid. I was going to say, would you ever do business with him? I mean, it sounds weird, but the numbers are there. The numbers are there? Nah, I don't know if the numbers are there. I, I, listen, do you know what, the, what would happen to this guy? He ain't fighting in the UFC. These guys are... You're getting me talking about this fucking guy again. He's getting hand-picked opponents, and God knows what else is going on with that whole fucking thing. I, it, it's all, there is a market for that. That's not what I do. That is not what I do. People want to see that, and, and, and you know, people want to see it, and, and it's great, and this kid's going to make a couple bucks before this, this ride is over, and uh, it's just not what I do. What I do is what happened tonight. What happened tonight is we sold this place out, and it was packed, and uh, the numbers that you're hearing that they did are full of shit. They're full of shit, okay? They didn't pull those kind of numbers at all, not even fucking close. And um, tonight, what happened here tonight is what I do. The best versus the best. There is a market for that. People want to see that stuff, and that kid's going to make a couple bucks, and good for him. Blessing. But that's not there you what go. I do. Blessing. And our final question for Here's me. From this point oh. on, do you think the UFC will have that uh, mentality to keep setting the standard on all the round because in the boxing side, people see that number that you said was bullshit, the 1.3, and they want to know where the numbers are going to come from the pay-per-view side. Well, you got to say to that, that criticism because Jake Paul comes out of nowhere busting all this money, and then people, like people are saying a fake fighter is making real money. How much did he make? He made a well, well, bonus. <laughs> they said 2.5 to 3 mil. Yeah. They, they, they said they did fucking 2 million pay-per-view buys too. I don't, I don't believe it's 1.3. Okay, I didn't do that either. I don't believe anything they say. That's a fucking circus. That's not a real. And none of that's real. I mean, do you think any of that shit that's going on over there is real? Come on, man. I built I, I built a real business here, a real sport. That that's a that's a freak show. Uh, no chance you're ever going to get Dana White mincing words and and Jeff Kane agreeing with Dana White, man. That doesn't happen all the time, Jeff. But I'll say this. Dana's one of those guys you love as a media guy because you can just pick at him a certain way and you know he's going to go off and you're going to get everything you need for your story. For I mean, But, man, it's just, uh, yeah, advocate for peace. That's not what he does anymore after the CM Punk disaster, LOL. Um, yeah, but, Jeff, I swear, man, when I hear Dana White talk about Triller and about Jake Paul, it, it's he's dead on. He's dead on with what he's saying. I don't know if I believe the numbers either, 1.3 million Whereas UFC 261, the early numbers from ESPN Plus were 700,000 buys without the overseas being counted yet. So those are pretty legit numbers. But I, I don't know, man. I, I don't think I buy their numbers either, honestly speaking. But I do know this. I do know that when we were um, on the air during that fight, we were doing a stream during the fight, the chat room was huge and the numbers would have been through the roof. So when I look at what, um, what Jake Paul's able to do, and I look at the attention that he's getting from all these MMA. And Dana said it. That's the most important part of what Dana just said to me. He's got all you guys writing about him. He's got all you guys talking about him. And then he goes, fuck, now you got me talking about him. That's what Jake Paul's doing. And he's, he's beating every single one of us mercilessly and relentlessly right now in that game. Because we're all bought in hook, line, and sinker. All of us. The whole sport. I mean, it's almost embarrassing. I mean, it's... It... As a group, it's almost shameful to, to be a part to, of a group like that. I want to get like back that. to Jake Paul. I want to get back to Jake Paul saying that he was a guest of the UFC. I want to know yes. where he was sitting because there are floor seats, and then there is a special section for the fighters and VIP that are guests of the UFC, and you know what section it is, you know. Mm -hmm. And so, if Jake Paul was in that section, then yes, he was a, a guest of the UFC. If he was not in that section and he just bought the seats for himself, I don't know. So it's hard. Actually, that doesn't look like the VIP section. It looks like he. Do we have just that? Uh, guys who are, are running the show in production, and, and uh, one of our guys had a good point and said maybe the DC thing was a work, and DC is trying to create a payday for himself. But um, uh, do we have that picture that I sent in of Jake Paul's Instagram, where he's got the well, two I'm middle looking. fingers up? 
I mean, you, you, you know that there's that section uh, right next to the. Yeah, there it there is. There it is. Yep. And we're all buying right in. And he's right there doing that. Fuck yeah. you. I got your money. That's what he's saying. You're making me money. Be careful rubbing that in people's faces, man, because money can be taken right back. But anyway, Jake, Jake Paul's a, a, a flash in the pan, man. I mean, Triller is is a circus. Well, what's crazy is that maybe joke. that's what people want. <laughs> you know, that, I mean, that's what's crazy about it is that I don't I don't dispute those pay per view numbers, honestly, considering the social media presence of them and how many people I knew were talking about it. There were just as many people talking about Triller as talking about the UFC pay per view uh, on Saturday before. I'm talking about leading up to it, asking yep. me, you know, because you always get you, you know buddies that are uh, who's going to win this fight and what do you think about that. Everybody's freaking out over Jake Paul and Ben Askren, and I was, and I would just tell them, "What the hell are you? What are you even watching that for?" Um, but it was a weird variety show type of circus that I don't know, man. It was a train wreck. It's hard to look the other way. I mean, that's part of it. But yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't like talking about Jake Paul because I don't feel he's a real fighter. He's not. He's not a real no. fighter. I mean, he runs into anybody. He will not accept a mixed martial arts fight with people. No, he, he will not He'll get his ass. Kicked. I, mean, I, don't, I don't care. I don't care who, who they line up. He won't do that. He, he wants to hand and Dana's right. He wants to hand pick people to box. Mm -hmm. uh, and boxing is not mixed martial arts. It is not. But Here's the sad boxing. thing. Here's the sad thing, Jeff. The sad thing is that UFC fighters haven't made enough money in their career. And the disparity in pay is so bad that someone's going to take the $500,000 or a million dollar payday like Ben did. Someone else is going to take that. How many fighters are, are Mike Perry's practically begging for it right now? I mean, think about that. Most UFC fighters retire with no money. Most. A very large percentage and overwhelmingly. And it I mean, sucks. Most, most boxers. I mean, you know, whenever you look at I mean, we I, I did a comparison several years ago and, and just like did like the top 100 boxing salaries versus the top 100 mixed martial arts salaries. And look, there's like three people in boxing that make money. Four now that Jake Paul's entered the scene. Nobody else in boxing makes money. No one. Canelo. Canelo. There's one name. I'm saying there's four yeah, no, people. No, but I'm saying who are the four? Who are the four? Are they, I don't even know if there are four. I mean, I'm I mean, wondering. Floyd. <laughs> Floyd, Canelo, Floyd, well, Floyd, Pacquiao yeah. when he comes back, and Fury. Floyd's That's out. it. Yep. No, nobody else makes any money. No, nobody makes any money. The, the, the guy on the preliminary card of the Floyd Mayweather fights or the Tyson Fury fights is fighting for $3,000 fucking dollars, the same as a UFC fighter. And that's yep. another talking point that boxers say. Yes, the biggest boxer in the world is going to make more money than the biggest mixed martial artist in the world. 100%. Yep. And, and let's not forget, let's not forget a journeyman MMA fighter with a 13 and 15 record named Artem Lobov from the famous thing with the bus with Connor and Khabib beat a two-time world champion in Pauli Malignani in the ring in bare knuckle boxing. It was a boxing match and a journeyman mm -hmm. MMA fighter beat a two-time world champion. So let's not say, you know, boxers will all beat MMA fighters in boxing because Loboff proved him wrong. No, I, yeah, I, I think that some mixed martial artists could go over into boxing and be successful. Uh, but they're going to have to give up martial arts. Uh, Max because, Holloway, for example. Poirier. Well, Connor. but we've had it before. KJ Nunes mm -hmm. was a professional boxer and was a yep. was a great mixed martial artist. Chris Lytle was a professional boxer. Um, it, it isn't new. It, it's not, and they're successful boxers. Uh, there's a slew of, of of high level kickboxers who have who've come into mixed martial arts. Overeem, you know, I mean. Uh, uh, tons of tons of these guys. Israel Adesanya, Wonder Boy, uh, Wonder Boy, yeah, yeah, Wonder Boy. And so they, you can do it, but the problem is for for you to be a top level boxer, you can't practice kicks, <laughs> you can't practice takedowns, no. you can't work on your jujitsu. It has to live and breathe boxing. And so boxers are at an advantage right out of the gate, right? You're so you're focusing on one art. I'm having to focus on five. You, you know. And then you're calling me out to fight you in the one art that you're a specialist in, you, you know, so I'll, I'll do this. Let's bridge the gap, right? Let's bridge the gap. All right. So he won't fight mixed martial arts and mixed martial artists don't like to go box. So let's, let's do a kickboxing bout, right? Let's meet in the middle. I, ben Askren still can't take you down, you know, but he can kick you in the head. You know, he can knee you in the head and he can elbow you in the head. Let's mix. Let's do that. 
So if boxers want to fight mixed martial artists, have some goddamn integrity and at least fight them in a kickboxing match, you know? Because all you're doing is trying to stack the deck in your favor and get publicity because you beat up some or, or do one MMA round. Wrestling. Do one. Do a ten round fight with two MMA rounds or three. They wouldn't in there somewhere. Look, if you want, they will never do that. Never for an MMA fight. Book it for two minutes. Book it for two minutes, and you're still going to have a minute and a half left over. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. This is UFC Fallout on MMA Weekly. Jim Greasehopper, Jeff Kane, powered by CBD Emporium, featuring Level Select CBD. Enough of this Jake Paul shit. But he is brilliant. I'll give him that on what he's doing. But Level he's Select CBD fun. and CBD Emporium, great partners of the show. And I'll tell you what, I, I'm active every day, guys. I'm boxing. I'm not a fighter, but I box every day, you know, and, and I really appreciate how hard it is. So I'm not one to denigrate people because I suck. But Jake Paul's not a real fighter. I don't say that. But CBD Emporium and Level Select CBD right now teaming up with us. They're going to give you 50% off your order right now, which is buy one, get one free with the code MMA50. Buy one, get one free at stayinthefightmma.com. MMA 50 level select CBD three levels for three levels of pain, discomfort, trouble sleeping. Your life is going to be so much easier when you start using these products. They're all natural. They have high levels of CBD with no THC. They're not drugs, nothing to do with it. You know, it's, it's about time we stay informed with the stuff that actually matters in the world, like your kidneys and your liver, for example, with all the aspirin and acetaminophen and, you know, ibuprofen you've taken for years and all the pain pills and Man, I will tell you what, there's a, I forget who it is, but there's a former NFL player in the news right now who's literally on life support because of all the painkillers he took and because of all the acetaminophen and ibuprofen because of a condition he had, it's actually killing him now. So that stuff can add up over the years and do a lot of damage. Not going to happen with CBD. Stay in the fight, MMA.com. The code is MMA50, and we are pumped to have them and to have you aboard. Level select CBD. Stay in the fight. All right, Jeff, let's get to this damn fight card. Good Lord, we've been on for almost an hour, and we haven't even talked about the magnificence of these three fighters at the top of the card. Now, we talked about the Weidman injury. Happy for Lionheart Smith to get the win, and, you know, Jimmy Crew, that's that's tough to lose a fight that way, and now he's got the torn ligaments. So the first two fights on the main card end in horrific leg injuries and victories for Anthony Smith and Uriah Hall. But what we saw after that, Jeff, those three fights, and that's what Dana White was talking about. I left that fight card, and, and I want to get your perspective on this. People are saying it's the best UFC fight card of all time. People are always going to say that when there's a great fight card because the recency bias. But this fight card, especially those three fights, you are not going to see. I mean, that that level of greatness that we saw from Valentina Shevchenko, from Rose Namajunas, and from Kamaru Usman, that level of greatness is rare to see once on a fight card. We got it three in a row. What an unbelievable night. Yeah, I mean, they're, you know, they're, those were big, big fights. Three three title fights headline the fight card. Uh, Valentina just completely dominated. I mean, Jessica Andrade made her look like she shouldn't even been in there with her. Uh, oh. Rose Rose uh, set up that kick beautifully and did that. Um, uh, you know, I, I, have mixed, I have mixed feelings on that because I almost want to see it run back. I'm not saying that that was a fluke by any means. Rose set that up beautifully beautifully but i'd like yeah. to see you know it's, it's hard for me to watch fights that just end in like three sec or you know the she first exchange because I, I feel like we didn't get to see a fight i'm like man that sucks that guy got clipped early that's not what happened in the main event at all <laughs> cabarro uh i mean boy he 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 baptized street jesus man i mean that oh, punch boy. was crazy and he had oh. his number before he does that, he lands He lands a good shot on Masvidal, and Masvidal has his hands down, and he smiles at him. I knew it was over then. I knew it was over. Right there. If you get Masvidal, right there. It was done. It was done. And then, and I think that, that Camaro knew it, too. I, I really think that Camaro and Valentina had performances that were outrageous, right? Just made it look like they're so far ahead of, of the game in their divisions uh, that, it's, that it's not even, you know, it's, it's not even funny. It's crazy. And then Rose did what Rose did. Um, spectacularly, right? I, but I, I feel like the other two fighters dominated and solidified their dominance in their divisions where Rose didn't really do that, but she did win back the title and looked really impressive doing so. Landed a beautiful kick. Man, that question mark kick is sneaky, right? Because you'd lift, you could see before Rose lands it, she lifts that knee like twice. And then, and we talked about it that night, we leave bites on a leg kick. And so she goes back to try to avoid a leg kick and boom, high, <laughs> right to the jaw. It is so, so precision. I mean, I hope people can appreciate what Rose did there. 
But I would like to see run back because I didn't feel like we Lee really got a chance to show anything. You, you know what I mean? She just, you just got ate a kick to the head, fights over. You didn't, really didn't get to display anything. Uh, so no, I would it, like to see if, that. If it was a different did. division. Sorry, Jeff. I was going to say if it's a different division where it's loaded and like, for example, you know, men's lightweight or, you know, welterweight or 35 even loaded division, probably not going to happen. But here you've got a girl in Thug Rose who's already beaten Joanna twice convincingly, dominated her both times. Once was a finish um, and the other one was a five round. I mean, there was no doubt at the end of that five rounder. So she has that going for her way Lee does. But normally in this situation, you wouldn't see a champion get finished like that so early and so spectacularly and even be thinking about a rematch. But I, I think in this case, I might agree with you because, you know, Jan's at number three. You got Carla Esparza. Now, she's the one champion, former champion, who Rose hasn't fought and beat. And you could kind of complete that, you know, that list. It's always well, nice Rose to beat every former her. champion in, in her weight class. Rose fought her for the inaugural strawweight champion. Oh, you're right. No, this is way back. You're right. My bad, Jeff. This was well, back in 2014. Fighter, yeah. But you're it's right. a rematch that jo that Rose lost. And Rose is the champion now. It was so a loss. Yeah, she doesn't have a win name. over her. That was my point. Yeah, she doesn't have a win yeah. over her. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, yeah I agree. Is, so I, I think that Carla's sitting in a great spot because of the win she has over Rose. Because you're not going to do Joanna now. And Wheelie, nope. you could do. But, but, but you might not want to do. I think that if the UFC does that, it's because China's opened up or something happens to where they're like, hell yeah, let's run that one back. We, we can't afford not to. Uh, but I, I think that Carla is, I think Carla has a fight coming up too. Um, if she wins that, then, then she, I think that she's going to get the number, get the title shot against Rose. Uh, we'll see, but good, good, good on Rose, man. I mean, Rose, like I said, you, we, we both had hard times reading it because Zhang is so pinpoint. And you, you said it, she's laser focused. It's hard to get in her, in her head. Uh, and then Rose is kind of Rose, like she'll chant to herself and even talk to herself until she's hard to get a read on where she is mentally. And then they get in there and she set that up like, I mean, I, I, I can't stress that enough. That was one of the most beautiful setups that I've seen on this level of mixed martial arts because you just don't see it. Like you, you just don't see it. You see people laying head kicks and that, but you don't see a girl faint like two times and then to wait and wait. And then, oh, I'm going to faint the third time. She bit on it. Boom to the head. It was so calculated, so calculated, man. Rose scares the hell out of me, Jim. Rose scares me now. Pat Barry, you're a crazy you. man. <laughs> crazy man. Jan, Jan, uh, Jan Zion, I can't even say her name, is uh, as far as his yeah. opponent coming up. She's number three. But I also think about the rankings and look at Mackenzie Dern sitting there at number five, yep. making a rise. And, and maybe they, you know, can get some heat from her. And, you know, Jan's really good, by the way, and dominating mm -hmm. victories in back to back to back fights. You know, against some pretty good, some pretty good competition. When you're talking about, you know, Angela Hill and Carolina Kalkevich and Claudia Gadelia, so I think that that division is kind of, you know, because of of the lack of numbers and the number of fighters overall, and the, and at the top especially, you're just not going to have that depth. But it is a pretty decent division, and I look at that straw weight. It might be the best division, top to bottom, in women's MMA. It actually might be. And Thug Rose is at the top of it right now. I almost changed my mind and picked her. I, I had a feeling and I didn't do it. I picked Wei Lee like you did, but I just felt like Wei Lee was definitely going to stand and trade with Rose. And that opened things up like that kick. And, and Wei Lee never saw it coming. Like you said, beautiful setup. And, and the, the moment that everybody's talking about, and I love Pat Barry, he's with her, he trains her, lives with her. And he's like, You're the fucking best. You're the best. You're the best. And then Rose finally goes, I'm the best. And we know she's been open about her struggles, man. I get a tear. She's been open about her struggles with mental health. And she was fighting for her, you know, her country and her family so much, you know, coming at Thug Rose and, you know, the, the bus incident really affected her big time. And, you know, the, the, the slam against Andrade was a tough way to lose. And I thought she was really hurt for a little bit there. So it's been a tough, you know, go of it recently for Thug Rose, but let's not forget how she dominated an all-time great champion. And we saw how great Joanna was in the Wei Lee fight. Joanna was certainly not washed up and was certainly not past her prime. And Thug Rose beat her easily twice. This is a legitimate great mixed martial artist in Rose Nami Yunus. And I think she's going to be atop that division for a while. I mean, Rose just hasn't been able to be consistent. You know, uh, I mean, I'm trying to think of her title fight. She lost to Sparza in a title fight. She beat Joanna in a title fight, beat Joanna in a title fight, lost to Andrade in a title fight, and then beat. So she's three and two in title fights. 
Um, mm -hmm. She just needs consistency. You know, she just needs consistency. Um, but, you know, I think it's a testament to Trevor Whitman. Because I'll say this, because people don't remember Rose and Invicta and stuff. Rose was a oh. submission fighter. On Whitman the had a big fighter, night. Dana White, <laughs> Dana White was saying that she was the next Ronda Rousey because of her submission prowess. She was tapping yes. everybody out. And then Everyone. she comes into the UFC and that Joanna fight just out of nowhere. Boom. She knocks out Joanna. And then, you know, you're kind of like, was that a fluke? They run it back. She wins the unanimous decision and, uh, you know, went toe-to-toe -to -toe with, with Joanna for that fight. And then you're like, wow, you know, maybe Rose is a striker. And then in this Wee Lee fight, you know, Zhang is a hell of a striker. Fast, straight punches, straightforward, aggressive style. Rose just, you know, <laughs> drops her with a head kick. So, uh, Rose, we've seen a transformation of Rose Namajuna since she was in Invicta and, and on the Ultimate Fighter until where she is now. I think she's in her prime well, now. And only you might had be three right. fights in Invicta. She might be there for a long time, right? Yeah. Well, I think she's in her prime right now. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's gonna. Uh, Jan is an interesting is an interesting fight. I, I don't think that Carl is an interesting fight right now. I think that it sells, and I think Rose will jump all over that because uh, outside of Asparza's wrestling, you don't have a hell of a lot to worry about against her. Um, and Mackenzie so I think Dern. Rose. Yeah, now Dern like is the one that that I think that that people. I'd be careful with McKenzie because McKenzie is not the striker that Rose is, but Mc, and, and Rose is way better on the ground than people McKenzie has faced, I think. Uh, yeah. Although McKenzie's in another level on the ground. I mean, yeah, you can't compare Rose to, to McKenzie on the ground, but Rose Multiple is so good. World champ, jiu-jitsu. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know if I would if I put McKenzie there yet. I might want to get her one or two more fights uh, to let her get her striking better because right now McKenzie uses her striking just to close the distance. And against Rose, Rose, Rose will make you pay for that. Uh, not to mention closing the distance against Rose, that, that that's going to be a crazy scrambles and stuff. I like that fight. I just don't know if McKenzie's ready for it just yet. Well, here's another here's another possibility, and this is the one that I think is the most likely. Joanna and Wei Li, too, winner gets mm -hmm. Rose. I mean, that makes the most oh, sense, I, right? After the first, it was an incredible fight. Yeah, no, I, I think that that's, you have to run that one back now. Joanna I mean, has, has to beat her be to get that shot. Yoana has to beat Wei Li to get that shot again because Rose already beat her twice and she lost to Wei Li. So I think she has to beat Wei Li in the rematch to get a shot here. I do. I, I think that I think I agree. I I, I think Wei Li could get a, a, a shot without fighting again, but it's going to come down to what the UFC's plans are and the dominoes falling into play. You know, all, all the all those crazy things behind the scenes that just fights fall into place. Uh, outside of that happening, I feel like you're going to see Joanna and and Wei Li fight. And then you're going to see Rose fight the winner of, of Jan and uh, Sparza. That, that, that's how I think that's going to play out. Um, but who, who okay. knows, man, especially with COVID and the testing and, and everything. But, but, but I think with things opening back up, if China opens back up, the UFC will jump right all over putting Weedley uh, back into a title fight. Or, or even the, the rematch with Joanna in China would be pretty cool, too, if you think about it. And, and you talked about Thug Rowe. That's only her second knockout. In her UFC career, yeah. in her career, Joanna was the first. You mentioned that she was KO'd by Andrade on the slam, and then she got the KO of, of Wei Li. But, Jeff, to speak to your point, Angela Hill, Paige Van Zant, Tacia Torres, Michelle Waterson all have one thing in common. They all got submitted by Rose Namajunas in the octagon. So she has five yeah. submission wins, and, you know, she, she can do it all. Now, I don't know how she'd feel about being on the ground with Mackenzie Dern. Probably not the smartest thing in the world. But, you know, scrambles and wrestling and using striking and mixing it in, it isn't just grappling, right? Although you've got to be really careful. And Dern can get the submission anywhere from any time. So we've talked a lot about Thug Rose and Valentina with an incredible performance against Esparza. You know, we haven't really mentioned the possibility of a super fight between them. But Rose has more business in her division to take care of. Valentina is in Amanda Nunes territory now, Jeff. They're, they don't have anybody yeah. to fight. Mm -mm. They're running. No, out I don't know what they're going to do with Valentina. And, and I don't think that Rose is ready to go up and, and challenge that. Uh, I, I think that Rose has to win a couple of fights or defend her title a couple of times before we throw her into that. Um, so Valentina, who would be next you heard for Valentina? Her Valentina wants the Nudez trilogy. That, that's what she wants. Oh, um, yeah, for sure. I, I want I, a million I, I'm dollars. I'm all for so that, man, give it to but me. I don't. Yeah, I don't know that the UFC does it. Dana White did not sound like he was too thrilled about that fight. No. I'm thrilled about that fight, but Dana is not thrilled about that fight. But honestly, it's it, I agree with everything Valentina says. That fight's going to happen naturally. There's no one for Amanda to fight. There's no one for Valentina to fight. So who are they going to fight? They're going to have to fight each other again. Except this time, 
Third time around, you might see Valentina come out. Look, Valentina was in both of those fights, and they were incredibly close fights. Mm -hmm. They were close fights. And she's and she's so, really legitimately too small to fight Amanda. So she's giving that up. And she was right there with her in both fights. I agree. Yeah, they were great. I mean, they weren't the most yeah, pleasing it, fights to watch. But the skill well, level. So, yeah. I mean, I appreciate the skill level so much that I'm, I'm watching that, you know, as part of it. And I'm not just looking for bombs being thrown and people being finished. But the level of well, skill. is the most well-rounded fighter fight. in the game. You know, I'll, I'll, I mean, I say that all the time, oh. and I know people are going to be like, Jeff, get off Valentina. Mm -hmm. Valentina is the best fighter in the world, man. There's no holes. I mean, she just went out there and took down and out grappled and submitted a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu black belt. Hip belt. tosses. She goes, yep. She, yep. She goes out and knocks out people who are strikers. And then she goes toe to toe with Amanda Nunes for five, for 10 rounds, actually, 10 rounds, 50 minutes. There's the way in and, for the two for the second yeah. fight, Jeff, up on the screen. And she didn't go to sleep. She didn't get wobbled. You, you know what I mean? I mean, you think about how dominating Amanda Nunes is over all of those people. I mean, she knocked out Misha Tate. She sent Ronda Rousey out of the sport. She head kicked mm -hmm. Holly Holm into another dimension. Cyborg. Yeah, and then she gets in there with Valentina and can't hurt her. She just she can beat her, but she can't hurt her. It's crazy. It's crazy. The, the world's a crazy place. But Valentina is absolutely, in my opinion, the, the greatest female fighter of all time. Outside of Amanda Nunes, then Amanda has the two wins over Valentina. But I feel like if Amanda was Valentina's size, Valentina wins that fight. So, uh, so and and weights notwithstanding, obviously the weights are different. But prime versus prime, all things being equal, Cyborg Amanda Valentina is, oh, I, is I Cyborg legitimately that. third on that list because she was women's MMA forever yeah. before Ronda. Is Cyborg three? Prime Cyborg. She might be. Cyborg might be lower than that. I mean, you got, you got to okay. Cyborg. There's not many people in that division, you know, and Cyborg beats you with aggression, you know, and whenever she went in there against a technical striker, she got face planted in Nunes, uh, you know, and so I, I don't feel like Cyborg's on the same level of Amanda or Cyborg and for or Rose for that matter, when it comes to skill set, when it comes to just skills. Like, you know, uh, uh, Cyborg gets wide in her punches. She gets wild. And Amanda exploited the crap out of that. Everybody knows that about Cyborg. You know, if you hit Cyborg, she's coming back at you with a flurry of wide hooks. And you just got to avoid them or you don't. Most people don't avoid them and lose. Uh, Amanda, Amanda was so I just don't, fast. Yeah, she was I just so don't fast put and so Cyborg precise there. in that fight. Yeah, Cyborg's a great champion. One, I mean, one of the greatest female fighters in the history of the sport. But I'm talking about technical abilities I, I don't put her on the level of, of of valentina or nunez and you know and there's and there's people i might not put her on there uh, yeah she's at least she three is the high she is in my book all right there you go cyborg three maybe not three the highest she could be is yeah. three it's ufc fallout on mma weekly powered by cbd emporium featuring level select cbd buy one get one free at stay in the fight mma.com with the code mma50 for level select and you also get 30% off CBD Emporium products right there as well. Stay in the fight, MMA.com. The code's MMA50. Level select CBD. Stay in the fight. And Jeff, we saved the best for last. And, and I, I'm reticent to call him the best on that card because what we saw from Rose and what we saw from Valentina, you can't beat. I mean, it doesn't get any better than what either one of them did. But Kamaru Usman did match it. Kamaru Usman went in there, and he did exactly what he said he was going to do. He said he was going to put an end to it the only way he needed to. He needed to finish him. He called it putting a stamp on it with Masvidal. There was no six days, no 20 pounds in six days. It wasn't across the world on Fight Island. There were full camps, and he came out. And, and look, Jorge Masvidal did everything he could. He sold the fight. He, he said everything he needed to say. He brought his A game. But, Jeff, you and I, and, and as the fight was happening and as the first round was happening, I'm like, Holy shit, man. Kamaru's twice as fast as him. This is not going to go well. Kamaru's twice as fast in the striking. And we said that going in. I don't think Masvidal could beat Usman just standing and striking. I didn't think he had a chance anywhere in this fight. And clearly, there are two levels in the men's welterweight division right now. There's Kamaru Usman and the field. Period. I mean, there's different levels beneath him, but he is so far ahead right now. He's lonely. And Jeff, he's getting better. He's getting better every fight with Trevor Whitman and sparring with Justin Gaethje in Colorado. He's getting better every fight, becoming more mean, more nasty, looking for finishes, looking for big-time wins, and just ending people with that violent streak 
that we're seeing as he's not only hitting his athletic prime and he's hitting his, his prime as a champion, Jeff. This dude is absolutely unbelievable. And people are going to say Masvidal may be not the top contender in the world and maybe didn't deserve that. I think he did after stepping in last year. But it's clear after watching the Burns fight and watching this fight, and then, of course, you think of the Woodley fight, he absolutely dominated Tyron Woodley. The only person he didn't dominate is Colby, and you know Colby's next. So Usman, all he has to do is, is finish Covington again, and he is literally, I mean, he's already the undisputed king and might be, pound for pound, the best fighter in the world. No, he's got four title defenses, and half of them were against a journeyman. Now, you know, he's, no way, he's not even close to No, John but Jones. I mean, not, like, not in the even, world now. The best in the world right now. Not not saying he deserves to be above oh, Jones yeah, for Yeah, you're not talking about pound for pound right now. You're just talking. Yeah, okay, I got you. You're not talking about the pound for pound. You're just talking about the best fighter in the world right now. The, the best the best Ooh. fighter in the world. Like, if I had one UFC fighter and I start a brawl in a bar and I pick one, I want Kamaru. Yeah, I mean, look, Trevor Whitman, what he's done for Camaro just with the jet. That's what I like about Trevor Whitman. He doesn't, there's, we don't have to re, re, uh, invent the wheel. You know, like, you know, we don't have to change your entire fighting style. He likes to add to your style. Yeah, you know, so he's like, what can I add to Camaro's game that's going to take him to another level? And he got him the jab and the jab combinations start to follow. And we've seen that out of him. And with Rose, I think he just gives her confidence. He gets back into the kicking. Rose, you are the best fighter in the world. And gets just confident letting your hands go and stuff. I like Whitman because he takes a different style. They really are tailored uh, coaching specific to the athlete. And he adds different things to different people. But he's not like adding – he's not like throwing 700 things at you. You need to do this. You need to do this. You need to do this. He's just going to add one or two things that are really, really effective for your style. And I think he's done that for Kamaro. Kamaro is – yeah, I mean, until we see John Jones fight again, Camaro's up there. I mean, his jab, what he's doing right now, I hope Kobe Kobe gets ready, man, because I don't think he's out striking Camaro this he, time around. I, I think he's going to have some issues on the feet with with Camaro Usman. Um, you better better start working at wrestling and and see if you can get him there. Um, Camaro's up there, man. I mean, I'm just trying to think of other fighters at the top of their divisions. Um, because Izzy, we saw holes, right? It, it, even though it mm -hmm. was in a fight at light heavyweight, he, the holes were there. Um, yep. For the heavyweight champion, you know, I mean, Francis has had hoes. We know Francis has hoes, although he's closing his up as well. Um, yeah, I mean, Kamaro's up. I mean, he, there's there's not a better fighter in the world right now. I'll say that. There's not a better fighter in the world as far as, as that goes, except for maybe Valentina. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, that's that's yeah. where I put him up there. I and mean, as far as Volkanovski is yeah. pretty good, but I, I don't I don't put Volkanovski above Kamaru. Not right now. I need to see him more. I need to see more more of him. To to what what, I, what we knew about Usman before what the last year and, and the improvements that he's made in just this year alone, or in twenty twenty and, and so far this year is incredible. It's incredible. And like you said, he's getting better every day, and he's working with. That's what I like about Whitman now. Because I've known Whitman for a long time. He had a, he had worked with that big gym. And you're trying to work with too many fighters. And what I like about what he's done now is he works with a specific group of fighters, a small group, <laughs> you know, that he's kind of handpicked, that he feels that he can really help. And then yeah, look and at to have it. Rashad Evans as a mentor, too, I mean, all the way through is, I mean, geez, you know, that's pretty cool. A former champion and, and a guy who did it right. And I, I just but think tomorrow's – Seriously, man. His his limit is non-existent. I mean, and, and I, I don't want to, you know, discount the fact that he's training with Gaethje every day, too, because Gaethje is number 12 on the pound for pound list. And we know his striking. And, and I knew and, and I know Justin Gaethje. And I said to him, I'm like, dude, there's no way Masvidal's a better striker than you. Camaro's sparring with Justin Gaethje all the time, and he's a better striker than Masvidal. There's no way that he's not going to – he's quicker. There's no way that Kamaru's not going to light Masvidal up, and I knew it. going. I mean, it was that, to me, was the easiest main event to pick in a long time. And that's not a, a diss to Masvidal. I give him all the credit in the world. And, and, look, he took it like a man. He really said all the right things afterward. Respect, right, for Masvidal. A fighter's fighter. We said that all along. But he was very much outclassed in there, Jeff. And I don't think anybody in the division right now – Right, I just don't see anybody who could get in there. You know, it's MMA, it's UFC, and anything can happen in any fight. But man, I don't think anybody. I think Colby's going to get the shit beat out of him in the rematch. That would be my my first reaction after watching Usman against Burns and now Masvidal. 
Colby Covington might get the other side of his face broken. He, he he's dude. This this is I'm I, telling I you. Yeah, I don't like Colby's chances um, at all in in a rematch. Look, the one guy sitting there is is Wonder Boy. You know because that is an interesting stylistic matchup. That he, is he, an he, interesting. He, yeah, he controls the distance. You know, it's that yep. karate. He's going to use push kicks and stuff to keep Usman on the outside. He's going to keep him at the end of his punches. He's going to have a reach advantage. Uh, that's a very interesting stylistic matchup. So that's the fight that I'm gunning for. I know we're going to have a Kobe, and, and that's what we're going to do. But hopefully, you know, Wonder Boy stays where he is and is able to get uh, get a title fight soon because stylistically, that's the matchup that most interests me in the division for, for Kamaro. I think everybody, look, if you're going to try to out-wrestle Kamaro Usman, you're probably not going to win. If you're going to go out there and just get in a straight boxing match with, with Kamaro Usman, you're probably not going to win in that division. Now, a kickboxing match with, with, with Wonder Boy, now that changes everything. Kamaro all of a sudden might have to turn into the wrestler that he, that he, that he you know, was before to, to beat Wonder Boy. And so that one is interesting to me. It's, you know, it's as mentally stimulating. The other ones, I'm kind of like, ah, uh, I've seen Kobe. Kobe could have success. Uh, but I think that that window's closing and closing and closing because Whitman is, has really tightened up Kamaro's striking game. Yep. And he's got Magny there too. I mean, he's, he's number nine in the world. He, it's a pretty good camp, obviously, with Whitman and what they have going on. And, and Burns oh, yeah. and Wonderboy are going to fight. Gilbert Burns and Wonderboy are, are supposed to fight July 10th, which is McGregor Poirier when everyone will be in Vegas. Hopefully they do the Fan Expo and all the International Fight Week stuff. I don't know. Haven't heard anything about that. But, man, Kamaru Usman is at the top of the game. And what we saw, Jeff, that, that to me is my takeaway from UFC 261 as we'll wrap it up here in about five minutes, man. I, my takeaway from the night – you know, it's it was really shitty to see what happened to Weidman and, you know, on, on a lesser level to Jimmy Crute. That's, you know, you hate to see those things. And that's part of it. And that's, you know, the Jake Paul thing and fuck Jake Paul and the first fans being back. There's so many storylines. But the thing that stands out the most to me is what should stand out the most. The greatest mixed martial arts in the world. Valentina Shevchenko, Rose Namajunas, Kamara Usman. I mean, good God. It does not get any better than those three, and it does not get any better than the way that they perform. To have the first fight back with fans, the whole world's watching. It's a sellout. To perform like that in that moment for those great athletes, that's a career-making performance right there for all of them, and it just goes to show how great they are and how elite these athletes are, Jeff, at the top of our sport. All three of them. Incredible. Well, and, and what Rose showed is the the, the margin of error is tiny <laughs> you know it is tiny you make a fraction of a of a mistake against these people and against valentina rose or Camaro. you are done you are done you cannot afford to make a single mistake against those people um yeah you know the, the, the side story is definitely jake paul showed up i will say this jake paul decided to show up front row at a ufc event to promote himself so <laughs> ufc still still bigger than jake paul uh, yep. And, then, and guess who else and was then, there in the front row that nobody said a word about? Tom Brady just who, won another Super Bowl. No one cared that he was there. Everyone cares that Jake Paul was there. Isn't that crazy? Let's go. See, now I would have paid Tom Brady a lot of money to throw a football as hard as he could and hit Jake Paul in the head. That, that'll that sell millions of dollars. Yeah, but that's where we are today. That's We've got these freak show kind of things that are going to sell. I mean, because I'll tell you right now, if you put Jake Paul at the 30-yard line and said, you know, we're going to do an hour-long pay-per-view where Tom Brady's going to whip the, you know, footballs at his head for the next hour, it's probably going to sell a half million views, right? I mean, no, if it, if it were Jake Paul... If it were Jake Paul, he'd say, I want, I want to, uh, I want to compete against Tom Brady, but I throw with my right arm and he throws with his left or something. I mean, no, who knows what wanna, he would do. Yeah, he's going to want to play him in basketball. He's going to want to play him in basketball. He ain't going to play him in football. Yeah, he's that dickhead he on the playground that goes, I'll play you, but you got to play lefty. He's that, he's that guy. Yeah. Yeah. Look, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm hard on Jake Paul. It's not Jake Paul's fault. You, you know, I mean, I know that I hate on him a lot, yeah. man. And I, and he, and I despise everything that he stands for. But he, he has marketed himself, and um, he has. He's, he, he's, making, he's making a lot of money. Um, but it's not his fault. It's 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 the public's fault. You know that we're buying into it. You, you know, um, and maybe that's just how starved we are for entertainment these days. <laughs> you know, we we're, we're jumping on Jake Paul, and that's fine. But I I do feel what I what what I want to say about Jake Paul is I hope he's saving his money, and I hope he has a backup plan because this is not going to last forever. 
and nobody's going to care to see some 45 year old bald balding former YouTube star talking shit on the internet. So he's got about five years to get his shit together and, and provide for a future or, or, or you're going to, or it could be a tragic story. Uh, one of the, one of those Hollywood made for Hollywood films, you know, because, because of what goes on outside of, of, uh, or what goes on inside Jake Paul's house. I mean, let's put it like that. So you're what, saying what the, goes the, on the, the trill will be gone. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Like you're, you're uh, like on point with the puns today. Right. But, but I, that's what I worry about with Jake Paul props to him that he's making the money, but dude, this isn't going to last forever. You, you, you know, you're that one hit wonder. So you better put that money in the bank because there's not going to be another hit. There's no, there's nowhere to go after this. You, you know, no, once this and, plays oh, itself out, you're done. Muhammad Ali LA says WWE. That's a perfect place for Jake Paul. Actually, now that I think of it, oh a perfect God. place. Yeah, for, he'd have to be a much better athlete though. He'd have to be a much better athlete because those guys are, and girls him. are legit athletes and get him on a really a regiment get those abs popped out uh yeah actually actually the commenter's right right i mean you you always you always got an opportunity in the wwe our audience uh, is always on point jeff i love you guys in the chat thank you by yeah, the way that, that's, Subscribe, that's, a, that's the a valid point love you yeah that, that's a hundred percent valid point jake paul could absolutely go to the wwe and have a long career he, he absolutely could does he want to do yeah, that he, though because that's that's no, that he's got more money than than I mean he's got so much money already he's buying and selling mansions in Calabasas near the Kardashians for God's sake and that's a good place for him next to the Kardashians now that I think about it maybe they can put the curse on him look Bruce Jenner's a girl Kanye's losing his marbles Lamar Odom almost died in a crack house Chris Humphrey's out of the NBA Reggie Bush out of the NFL the curse of the Kardashians is real so maybe Jake Paul should move in next door what do you think about that I, I don't. See, what I think happened to Bruce Jenner and turned into Caitlyn Jenner is that Bruce had, was surrounded by all those women who were buying $10,000 and $30,000 dresses. And then one day, Bruce woke up and said, fuck it. If I'm paying for all this, I'm wearing the heels and I'm wearing the damn dress. That's what happened to him. That's my opinion. Except, uh, except for the fact that the Kardashian, like the mom and the and the girls are all multi-gazillionaires off this show. They are now. They, yeah, they are now. Thanks they to Ryan Seacrest for that. But maybe Jake well, Paul could move near them. You know, I mean, Justin Bieber lived you know, there. I mean, they could all have their little dysfunctional, you know what I mean? But I, I think it's, it's interesting. Why should I because... talk about the Kardashians? She likes the Kardashians. So yeah. my question poses to her because I'm like, look, would there have been a Kardashians without the sex tape? And she's like, oh, I don't know. And then you take no. it further back than that. Would there be Kardashians if OJ didn't kill Denise? No, no there <laughs> you wouldn't. No, yep. no, there wouldn't be. So a lot of things came into play for the Kardashians to be billionaires, but man, they are billionaires now. You talk about making money hand over foot. They, everything they touch turns to gold. Every uh, but, single yeah, but, freaking but except, thing they touch. Except for the people that you mentioned. Yeah, except for the people that you mentioned. They didn't turn to gold. So there uh, there so would so be yeah, no Jake, Jake Paul, Paul if it weren't the, for the Kardashians. And for Paris Hilton before them, you know, all the social media stuff. that And look, that sex tape with Ray J on the heels of the OJ thing with her father. And, oh, my God, just, uh, just you know, the, their dad ended up dying of cancer. I'm, I'm sure he would not have been too proud to see a lot of shit they've been doing. But it's just, you know, they make a ton of money. That's the America we live in, man. You know, you, you catch that. You, you ride that wave. You catch that fame. I'm not and you cash in I'm every not. single way you can. Props to Jake Paul. Props to him for doing what he's doing. Yeah. He's got Dana talking about him. He's got everybody. The whole like fan I said, I don't know screaming. It. Yeah. No, he's not. He no, just do doesn't seem like much of a good guy. Jake Paul? Just, just, let me answer that. Do you think this is all just an act? Like if you got Jake Paul just in his living room, you know, and you were smoking up with him or drinking with him or whatever, that he is like he is uh, in, um, in the public? Or do you think he's a different person? His followers love him. He, he's made a living out of doing stupid shit online. You know, he went to yeah, that I suicide that. forest and filmed it. He's jumping off roofs into pools. Just dumb shit, you know? But he for some reason, people, over the, yeah, he got in trouble over the forest stuff, too. Yeah, people uh, love dumb shit online. People love dumb shit online. That's that's my take. So he is I just mean, a dumbass no matter what city is what you're saying. <laughs> he's just kind of like the, the, the goofy kid, you know, doing stupid shit and. You know, it's funny when you when you watch it sometimes. Uh, my kids like his videos. My kids love Jake and Logan Paul. I mean, that's his demo. Gen Z. I'm, I don't, I Gen Z, asked, baby. I'm going to go in there. Yeah, after this show, I'm going to go. I'm walking right into Ryan's room and be like, you watch Jake Paul and, and his brother on YouTube? I want to know right now. Uh, Are you going to strip him of his Paul. last name if he does? 
<laughs> no, no. I'll turn him on to some better, better videos or something. I don't, I don't know. But look, we're in a YouTube generation. You know, social media changed the world. I mean, it changed the world um, in, in so many different ways. Like, uh, I mean, like right now, I mean, we're living in a political world where, where social media is everything. Uh, for sports, recruiting, everything, social media, um, the, the news, <laughs> you know, building your brand. Uh, these fake celebrities, but they're not fake because they're real celebrities. Just how they got there is really weird. And so Jake we're living Paul, in a Logan different Paul, world. like Dan Bilzerian, like those yeah. type of people. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, like you brought up Paris Hilton and, and you know, Nicole Richie, who's got her life together, by the way. Nicole has uh, Paris. I don't I don't know about. Uh, but we're, we're kind of in the beginning stages of the, of, of the social media. I, I know social media has been around a long time, but it, in the big picture of things, we're, we're just scratching the surface on it, and a lot of people have exploited it and tapped into its possibilities, and Jake Paul's one of those people. So, yeah, I don't want to say Jake Paul is a complete idiot, although he comes off like a complete idiot to me. Uh, but I do know uploading videos and editing the videos and, and to making sure that you're presented in the way that you want the public to see you, all of that's tremendous amount of work. And he does do that, you know, and, and so I don't do want that. that to get lost on people for, for him, you know, his hair has to be perfect, right? He, he the shirt that he wears, has got to be the one he wants. Everything is perfectly right. The gold medallion on his chain has got to be flipped around the right damn way for the camera. You, you know, I don't think that people understand the, the makeup and shit that goes on for, for the YouTube people and the, and the TikTokers and the, and the Instagram celebrities, influencers, I guess, if you want to call them. It is a shit ton of work. And if you watch the Kardashians, you kind of get an insight into that. <laughs> you know, it's like that's their whole yeah. world, 24-7. It's just 24-7 that you're on the job. Uh, so I don't want to knock him for that, man. The guy probably does work hard. Uh, I, I just, I just want to know what act two is. But our, somebody in the chat just threw that up. WWE is, is always there for Jake Paul, always. Yeah, he's going to get another fighter to box him for sure. He's going to get another fighter to box him. You know, eventually he's, he's look, you just eventually have to ignore him. That's the only way he goes away is if you ignore him. Dana's playing into it. The crowd's play. The whole UFC and MMA universe is literally in the palm of Jake Paul's hand right now. He's playing every single one of us. Every. How do you feel about yourself? You're watching this. Jake Paul's playing you too. Like this dude just keeps putting WWE, WWE a thousand times in the in the chat, yeah, Muhammad Ali, Ali. That's, that's where he belongs, where though. I mean, you know, like, like I wouldn't have a huge problem with Jake Paul if he were in the WWE. Just be like, well, he's a professional wrestler, you know. It's all fake anyway. This is all just kind of bullshit anyway. Except he's tried to present himself as a real fighter, and that and that's where it gets crazy for me because uh, I sometimes take offense to that. But then other times I'm like, you know what? What the hell do I care if people think Jake Paul's a real fighter or not? <laughs> you know, I could care less. To, to be honest with you, but other times I'm like, you know what? I don't like him getting publicity. Like he's a real fighter when, when, you know, you've got these mixed martial artists who, who are absolutely killers who get no publicity. It's, it's just hard to wrap, but the world's not fair, Jim. That that's what I have to accept. The world's not damn fair. It's not just, we're all not equal. Uh, Jake Paul's raking it in right now. And, and props to him for that, man. I just hope he's not a douchebag that he seems in private. That's Jeff Kane. I'm Jim Greasehaber. UFC 261 Fallout on MMA Weekly, powered by CBD Emporium, featuring Level Select CBD. Jeff, we have Reyes Prochaska coming up. We have the preview show that we're actually going to shoot, and that's going to be tomorrow. We're going to be live at 9 a.m. and 12, uh, 12 um, <laughs> Eastern. Sorry, 9 a.m. Pacific, 12 Eastern. That's the word, Jim. But we have Sanhagen and Dillashaw. TJ Dillashaw is coming back in a couple of weeks. Oliveira Chandler is the week after that for the lightweight championship, and that's a huge fight night with Diaz and Edwards. So we got some big fights coming up, and, and I just want to remind all of you, every single week, usually on Mondays, today we had some travel issues coming back from Jacksonville, but on Mondays, 9 a.m. Pacific, 12 Eastern, it is going to be right UFC fallout. Every Wednesday, UFC preview, 9 and 12, same thing, Pacific Eastern. And then every fight night, we'll be streaming live. We did big numbers again this past Saturday. Thank you so much to all of you. We appreciate all of you in the chat. We appreciate everything you're doing. Jeff, I just want to get your final thought. There's so much fucking fallout from this show. We did Jake Paul, Dana White, the fans are back, Weidman, you know, the three dominating performances. What is your biggest takeaway from the fallout from UFC 261 as we move forward? Um, I mean, my biggest takeaway is probably the fans are back. You know, we're, 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 we're back. You know, we're, everything's getting back to normal again. And it feels good. I mean, to be honest with you, it, feel, it feels amazing to be back to normal. 
uh, or getting a step closer back to normal. That's the, that's the biggest takeaway for me. Faults out to Chris Weidman. Speedy recovery on that, man. I know it sucks. Uh, I've been through that, man. I sat in a wheelchair for a year and then collapsed my hip on the first step I took when I walked. <laughs> you know? Uh, and so I understand where he is right now. I hope those around him, you know, uh, make it a little easier on him because he's going to be inconvenienced for six to eight weeks here before he can even walk or drive and all that. And then, then the three champions, man. I mean, Rose Nami Yunus, I, I think uh, physically and athletically, she's limitless on, on what, what she can do. And I think the, the same with Valentina and the same with Camaro, man. They're first, they're the best, and they are leading the way in the world of sports. It's the ultimate fighting championship. You can't deny it. And the things that Dana White did, that was my reflection after this fight card, to keep this sport going and his team, to do Fight Island, to do the Apex, to be first last year and this year. I mean, just, it just, I still can't comprehend it. When you really get into deep thought about that, it's incredible. Thanks to all you guys. I echo everything Jeff said too. Greatness on display. You know, you had the Jake Paul thing, the fans, but we just keep moving forward and we're going to get a lot of clarity in all these divisions coming up. And of course, we're building toward the big fights over the summer. McGregor, Poirier, one of them. Going to be an awesome time. Subscribe, like, all those things. Our Facebook's going through the roof right now. Our Instagram, our Twitter. Follow us on all the platforms because we are here for you. The website's killing it. Thank you to the fans who make all that possible and our great team that I'm proud to be a part of here at MMA Weekly. For all of them and for Jeff Kane, thank you for watching UFC Fallout 261 here on MMA Weekly, powered by CBD Emporium featuring Level Select CBD. Buy one, get one free Level Select CBD, 30% off CBD Emporium at stayinthefightmma.com with the code MMA50. Level Select CBD, stay in the fight. We're back tomorrow with the preview show for Fight Night. Until then, fight fans, keep your game tight and your mind right. We're out.